I? How are ya? I thought you were going to wear your pajamas. I was going to, but do you know what? It's a really interesting thing for me because I do sometimes dress quite sexy and sometimes like an absolute hobo and I embrace it all but with this new job I found that really hard to meet in the middle of like my professional life my sexual life so I've decided to go with like a little bit of sexy but total profesh with my jacket <laughs> well I'm actually do you know what because when you said I'm just gonna wear my pajamas I was gonna come in my pajamas so how embarrassing would that have been if I was like <laughs> so I was like oh shit you did me good it would have been awesome. I mean, I've still got my slippers on, so... I've actually I've actually got no pants on, so... <laughs> I don't believe it. I'll have to see it. I'll, do, I'll show you. Look at this. Like, here's Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, babe? How are you going? Yeah, I'm a little bit um, hungover, actually. I, I got excited. I haven't drank for, like, three months. I mean, after Radio Awards yesterday, I cracked the bubble, so... Oh, you know what? Well deserved. Well bloody deserved. I actually was going to reschedule with you because I, after I heard that you had the win last night, I was like, oh, she's going to be a bit dusty this morning. But I was desperate to get you on the podcast. So I was like, if anyone can do it, it's Morgs. Oh, you're a darling. Look, I had a big slab of lasagna with a poached egg on top and I am right as rain. So. Oh, geez. No, I think I've ever tried that before. That sounds yeah. like one of those like um, intoxicated food thoughts. Where you're like, <laughs> this sounds good. I'll just chuck everything in a bowl and eat it. It was pretty much like that. But, yeah. but congratulations um, on the win. What was it? Best Entertainment Podcast, wasn't it? Is that yeah. what you said? Yeah. Thank you. I know. I was so stoked. And I guess, like, bigger picture for me, it just feels like if, if a podcast like that and, like, the podcast that you're doing can be held in high regard and win an award like that sort of in that public eye, it's a real sign of the times to me that like we, we're coming into a level of more progression and we are ready to be learning and hearing and, and opening up these conversations so for me it's like a real win for humanity like I'm bloody pumped yeah um if you're listening Morgs does a podcast with Sharon Casey who is another amazing human being it's called the trainee sexologist if you want to check it out and that's actually your first your your training bit of your um sexologist part isn't it so if you do want to check out any of that you can go and do it and they won best bloody hooker so you know it's going to be good I don't even know where to start because I mean I, I met Morgs through radio we used to work together at MediaWorks and oh honestly there's no one like you Morgs there really isn't <laughs> There's, there's no one as crazy, as open, as beautiful, as loving, as so like, your aura is just so welcoming. And, um, you know, there, if there's one person in the world that was going to say, I'm leaving radio and I'm going to be a sexologist, <laughs> it would be you. I don't think anyone was really that surprised, were they? Well, I mean, to be honest, I can't believe they paid me for so many years to work in radio when I was actually sitting in the office counselling everybody and talking about sex and helping people unravel their sex lives. And it was like, yeah, it was pretty, f I mean, I loved radio. I loved because I was allowed to be creative and weird and wild and all the people that are there, like yourself, were very open and we're all kind of cut from the same cloth, really, I think. So oh, it's bloody weird. <laughs> You have to be at least weird in your own way to be in that kind of industry, 100%. Oh, absolutely. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, you know, like where you grew up, your, your upbringing, um, how you got into radio and that kind of stuff, and then we'll get on to the sexologist and the juicy talks. Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up uh, in Oporski, was kind of my grounding, my childhood, in the East Coast. Um, and that uh, gave me a very yeah, grounded, humble upbringing uh, with my mum, solo mother. And um, yeah, solo mums. I actually had a big discussion with a friend the other day about this. And, um, you know, we came from no money at all. And I just think that the friends that I've got that have had a similar kind of upbringing that haven't been able to rely on parents for handouts or money or a room to go back to to live if shit hit the fan really puts a rocket up your bum to work hard to make your own money to survive in the world um, and I think that's really made me hungry for success and um, and and a, a love of women and strong women you know that that have had a bloody hard time really throughout the ages to kind of get to this freedom 
point that we're at now. Um, and yeah, I, my mum realised that Potiki was too small for me. As you kind of mentioned, I'm a bit wild and that was starting to show by the time I was <laughs> um, doing lots of acting classes and um, wanting to be on stage. And uh, so she knew she had to get me to a bigger city. So we moved to Nelson. Uh, which was very white and shocking to my uh, very like heavy Maori friend upbringing, cultural immersion life that I'd been living down there. So um, is mum Maori? No, my mum and, and dad are both Pākehā, but okay. um, growing up I was pretty much the only sort of Pākehā friend in my mix. Oh, okay. um, and yep. I didn't really know any different. Like it was never highlighted, it just wasn't a thing. So... You know, just grew up with the the tea kanga of the, the the place, and you know, you just yeah, it's kind of come with me the whole way through, which has been really nice. What took your parents to Apodiki then, or your mum in particular? Was there any family and stuff there, or no? I believe that when like mum has said this to me, when her and dad broke up, she literally wanted to get away from her <laughs> as far away as she could. So she literally he's he's in the necky. And uh, she just literally went on the other side to the other knob on the east so I'm coast. Gonna go, I'm going to go as far as I can from you, mate. <laughs> she went yeah. up to the Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where she ended up. But, she, yeah, she knew nobody there. Wow. Brave. It was wild. Very brave. Very brave. Um, and then... Yeah, I met a guy on the beach in Nelson, actually, who was giving away free stuff from a radio station and I was like is this a job <laughs> and, uh, he was like yeah and I was like that's so cool and he was like what do you want to be when you grow up and I said uh famous on tv or something <laughs> and so he said oh lots of people start in uh, radio and move on to tv come and hang out at the radio station and see if you like it and I just remember walking around this whole, it was a big old house, big old villa, Fife Shire House in Nelson. And I just could not believe that people went to this place every day and made magic happen. Mm. And I was like, that is for me. So it turns out that guy was a total creep and was actually <laughs> grooming me as a young 14, 15 year old. Um, oh gosh. Jeez. But, okay. Wait, did he actually work in radio or? He did. He was the promotions oh. manager. Yeah. We won't Bad mention man. what radio station that was then. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, radio is really all I've ever known. Uh, for 15 years, that's the career I've chosen and I've done different um, depart work in different departments. And and then, yeah, like I was sort of saying, was I spent a lot of my time talking to people and, and counselling them and just openly taking away the taboo of sex. And I mean, I was farting in the office. I was all like, <laughs> getting everyone to do squat o'clock at three o'clock and I'd take my pants off for it. I mean, it was just wild in there. I just kind of gave permission, gave people permission to just be wild and be themselves. And it's, I was so surprised everybody would get on board with it, you know? So, but I guess I never felt fully fulfilled in that radio job. I loved it. I could have easily just done it as like, great, it's my day job, go home, live my life. But I felt like I wasn't really in service to the world. I wasn't actually giving back. I wasn't, you know, there was more to it, you know, that I, I thought I could be doing. And then when I, I didn't even know there was a job like a sexologist. Neither. <laughs> and then when I found out there was, I was like, this is incredible. Um, but it's all quite clinical. If you're just a, like go from a psychologist and then you do a sexologist degree. So I kept on looking and there's actually what I ended up studying in was to become a somatic sexologist, which means that you also work hands on with the body, if appropriate. So you're really working with like rewiring the brain, neurological pathways, um, the nervous system. It's a, a lot more integrated. And I actually think, you know, we're living, we're so much, I don't know, we're just not as embodied as, as we should be. And so this, this kind of work really drops you and brings you home to your body. So, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And then so, yeah, just, I just jumped in after 15 years of radio, threw that out. This is for me. I'm off. 
I, yeah. Well, yeah, because when you said you were like, I'm going to be a sexologist, I honestly was like, does she make that up? Like, is that, <laughs> I've never heard of that in my whole life. But in saying that, isn't that sad? Because nobody knows that they exist. And I feel like it's so important. Like sex is so bloody important. Uh, well, well, this is a personal personal belief, you know. Um, the yeah. physical is just as important as everything else. But with well, the physical comes the mental and the spiritual and all that kind of stuff. So... So, so now you're a, you're a qualified, sorry, what was the word you used before the sex? Somatic, which means in the body. Yeah. So are there different types of sexologists? Yeah, there's, there's only really two at the moment, but this is, I guess, an evolving field mm. as people are becoming more and more open to it and wanting to delve into um, their bodies in a, a sexual way. So there is just the, the main sexologist, which is the traditional way, which you would go and you would sit and you would just talk. Oh, okay. There's a somatic sexologist where with me you could come and you could just talk or we could move it to the body. Okay. So let's talk. <laughs> what do you mean like move it to the body? What is that what does that mean? Could you give like a wee example? Yeah, so I found um your last podcast episode very beautiful and raw and I just do want to really acknowledge your bravery, the the way you showed up. It was really special and, and really I think uh, such a gift for other people to see you being okay, look, I've been crying for the last two days. You can't get me worked up, all right? But I appreciate you and thank you so much. But I'm just going to... I'm okay. so bloody emotional from it. Oh, oh darling. I didn't, oh, I didn't expect the response. I honestly didn't. You know me more because like, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. Like, I just... I wanted people to feel safe and, you know, like, I guess normal for a lack of better word. But the response I got back, I was just like, shit, there are a lot of people out there that are feeling the same and... So, so yeah, thank you. Totally. Well, you're welcome. And I, I want to thank you because that's a thing. It, it is another piece of giving people permission. You know, we're sick of seeing perfection. That's not what life's about, you know. And when we see someone else be raw and vulnerable, we all, we all go, oh, God, that's, it's actually okay to be like that. So, yeah. And one of the, one of the beautiful things that you shared was about um, numbing out and you were numbing out the emotional body, but also the physical. And that's very common. We, a lot of us are walking around and we're not aware. We're not feeling the temperature of the air on our skin. When we have a shower, we don't feel the pleasure of that trickling water on our bodies. And that was one of my biggest sort of pieces of work is that I see that we are numbed out and we're numbed out in our genitals. And so the work that I can do on a body level is bring the awareness and rewire the nervous system to feel again. And so one of the things, for example, that I could do, say if a, a, a vulva owner came to me and said that they were numb and they couldn't really feel anything in their genitals, which mm -hmm. is really common. Um, what I would recommend is a, a yoni mapping which uh, yoni is another, it's, a, it's an old Indian Sanskrit word for vulva, the vulva oh, area. Didn't know that. Good to know. And, and when we do the mapping, we are, we are bringing the awareness of the brain and the touch on different bits. And it's like telling a story again. So like, this is my oh, vulva. Oh, you've come prepared. <laughs> well, I'm an educator. If you're, listen, if you're not watching the video and you're listening, she's just pulled up a, um, a wee, what would you call that, Morgs? Well, it's a vulva cushion, so we've got the big puffy outer labia here. I'm going to blow take right of this. <laughs> we've got the inner labia here. Okay, thank you, thank you, because I really wanted to, sorry, I wasn't concentrating one more time. The, the... Okay, so this is the outer labia, which has got a lot of erectile tissue underneath it, which puffs up when it's engorged when we get aroused mm -hmm. and um, underneath here we've got the clitoral legs and we've got vestibular bulbs and they all puff up and add to the uh, engorgement that happens in this area and we've got our inner labia so if I'm mapping a vulva I will be slowly touching or I'll be encouraging my client to touch themselves here while I tell tell that person what's underneath it what can they feel on a scale of one to five, what can they feel? And if they feel nothing, that's fine. But the, the other side could be completely different, you know? And if people do find areas of numbness, we just sit with it. We notice and allow. And I've just 
it will sound strange, but I have held different bits of a woman's um, labia or bits, and, and they've just cried because it's like a reconnection with themselves, you know? Um, so it's really powerful work. And I mean, it's pretty confronting as well. If you haven't looked at yourself in the mirror and seen your, your bits, um, some woman that's been their first time looking with me, you know, in the mirror and, and just witnessing is a really powerful thing as well. So yeah, it just, it just seems strange that, you know, we go for a massage or we uh, do different things with our bodies, but we always exclude the genitals. And to me, that's sort of perpetuating the shame and the guilt and society's um, spin on us that that's naughty and bad and keep it hidden and don't touch that, that's bad. So, yeah, it's about bringing it back to life and integrating it with the whole body. So do you just kind of guide them and teach them about their, their parts? And do, do they, if, does it ever end in climax or...? No, so there's communication the whole way through. So when I when I'm working like that, say with 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 the vulva, it's um pleasure is so welcomed, you know, but it is not necessary, and we take away any kind of agenda touch. Orgasm's not a goal, but it's welcome, you know. But but there has to be communication mm -hmm. around it so that we both feel safe and that it's appropriate and yeah and that's kind of a little bit why like during my training you know I had to do everything like um, learning about anal massage and so I did that with like men and working with the prostate and seeing their arousal yeah. and them wanting to really like ejaculate because it was like yeah. we're not taught how to hold on to sexual energy we, we get a build up and we want a release yeah. and I just don't feel really as safe working with men as I do with women in, in that regard to arousal and, and orgasm. Okay. So why is that? I just I I'm not quite sure yet and I guess it's still a line of inquiry that I'm going down. Um, I just I want to support men and hold space for them but I, I'm not I'm not sure. It's a bit dodgy for me. It's a little bit unclear. Is that because of like society ways or, you know, how like some men are portrayed when it's, when it comes to sex or is it preference that you're like, well, I know what vaginas are about, but penises are a whole different ball game. Like I need to do more study on that before I get to you guys. Yeah, it is a little bit like that, the societal thing, I think. And I, I, I hate to be a little bit broad and judgy about this, but I do feel in some regard that women are a bit more evolved in terms of um, boundaries in, in the sexual sphere, boundaries and safety. And I don't know if it's because of my personal experience with men where boundaries have been pushed or taken advantage of that, that I've actually, it's a personal thing, or if I don't trust that men can control themselves, which is a horrible thing really, because they're some really beautiful amazing evolved men out there that need some good sexual help but yeah I'm still I'm still figuring it out and you need to make sure that you feel safe you know you're giving so much of your energy as well so you want to put that into people that are genuinely going to take care of that and and appreciate you for that because it's a big and thing that you're doing yes yes it's sacred work yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, can we go back quickly to the guys and how you said you did the, the anal massages? Because I heard you talking about it on the training sexologist and oh my God, I was just, do you know what? I guess you you, listen, you hear it and you're like, ah, ha, 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 but then you get so intrigued about it. And I personally didn't even know this, but the, the G spot is in the male anus, isn't it? Correct. Yes, that's the prostate. The prostate. So, so could you explain the anal massage to us? Yeah. And who, yes. who, who who um volunteers to do this kind of stuff? Like the students will take turns. How do you find people that are keen for you to um I guess stick your fingers up their anus? <laughs> like how can you come across those people? Well, okay, uh, where do I start? So the whole prim like honestly, when I started seeing the course outline and I saw this anal massage, I was like, oh my. God. I can't do this and it had to start with me doing it to myself and wow well, you know I started masturbating quite young 
as you know as a kid and so I feel like I, I know how to touch myself and I knew my vulva quite well but I had never explored that area I've never had anal sex with like a penis or with the finger or anything else actually mm -hmm. and so even doing that for the first time was really pushed my boundaries but I actually liked it it was strange I was like this is kind of good and one of my teachers um, on the course Jack Moran he is the biggest advocate for anal massage and thinks that it can heal things like fissures and hemorrhoids wow. and because you're touching soft tissue when you're in the anus it is the easiest way to touch the nervous system that we can't touch on the outside the only other way is to go in through the mouth and down that way and you know our nervous system we're living in a society where we're all stressed out and we're on edge like this and what we really need for our nervous systems for our thyroid is to actually be calm and when you go in there and just stroke around and be explorative and loving to your asshole uh it relaxes the nervous system and so i mean it kind of you know i was reading all this i was like oh yeah this kind of makes sense but ugh, aren't there other ways to relax you know um yeah. but you know when i had to to move on and give it to other humans i i saw that wow they were so relaxed and they loved it and they hadn't i mean this one guy okay so yes it was really hard to get volunteers for this so you had to find the volunteers for your course I did. Do you, do you call up a mate and be like, hey, can I massage your anus? Like, how does that even bloody go? It was a bit like that. I had I had asked a few of my male friends yeah. and they were like, we really want to help you out, Morgs, but um, I just don't think it's for me. I mean, they were worried about arousal. They were worried about the unknown, who, yeah. all sorts of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was having coffee with a girlfriend and I said, oh, I think I'm going to fail this module. I can't find any man that's going to let me in his goddamn anus. And she goes, oh, my husband will do it. I said, oh. no, you can't just make him do that. She's like, oh, yes, I will. And I was like, mate, I'm all about consent here. You can't just be putting his butt on the line for me. Yeah, and um, anyway, she, goes, she went outside, made a call, came back. She goes, oh, yeah, he'll do it. I was like, are you serious? She was like, yeah, he's, he's up for it. So wow. I went around to their house that night and, and, and did it. So. Wash, okay. I he was out the lounge question. watching the Kardashians. <laughs> she was in the lounge and then you, what, you and him went into the room. And yeah. What, oh, wow. They must be very open-minded people. Shout out to them. That's pretty damn cool. They know that they're ideally just helping you out past your sexologist of course absolutely so. and i'm so grateful you know like oh, friends was it, was it awkward at all like what do you say hey could you bend over on the on the bed and i'll just do my thing because you're learning as well you know so you must have been bloody nervous i was and i was clunky you know i'm like okay cool you know so he was lying face down on the bed and i'd be like uh and i could tell he was nervous because his legs were tight together and i was like can you just um open wide a bit more and I think he didn't want me to see his balls from the underside oh. and you know well it was hard did you did you know him very well or yeah I did but the thing is like he's like the loveliest guy he's pretty quiet he only speaks if he's got a really important message oh, so wow. I was really really honored and shocked that he was up for it you know okay Just amazing so that was just one of the things that you had to do to train to be a sexologist. Was that probably the most uncomfortable thing for you, part of it? Definitely. It was just so foreign for me. And it was foreign that I would be so intimate with another body, a human mm. body, w that I'm not actually sexually intimate with. It was, it was a very big learning and a difference for my brain to work out that I could be looking at a man's body and rubbing his booty and about to enter and I didn't want to kiss him or yeah. you know it was it was strange it was hard for me to get my head around did you ever like sometime through the course be like oh I don't know if this is for me yeah absolutely um especially because there were different people on my course that seemed way more advanced and advanced in that realm you know people that have been sex workers um people that uh 
yeah, had, had been working as a psychologist and trauma, people with trauma and um, people that were nudists. So people that were really comfortable in their own bodies already or had been working a lot in, in that kind of a roundabout body field. And, and I just thought, shit, these guys, man, they can just do it all. And, and they, they seem to be writing up their assignments like, oh, it was great. It was easy. It was blah, blah. And I'm there pouring my heart out about how hard this was for me. Um, yeah, and I, I guess one of the, the big things that was like the difference with getting my brain around things, we had to do an exercise of witnessing someone masturbating and then you get witnessed masturbating as well. And I mean, I've done that like once with a partner, but it was very much like on show, you know, I was trying to look sexy. I was making noises that weren't really like what was feeling good for me. Like porn on right? Totally, mm -hmm. a little, little porno show. And um, so to actually be witnessed when you're really actually like, raw like an animal, masturbating as if no one's watching you, it just strips back the layers, man. I was a new person the next day. <laughs> I don't know if I could even climax or anything doing that. How, how, so was it another student that was watching you? It was actually my partner at the time. Oh, okay. But, so yes, yeah, so that, I think that made it easier, mm. but also it took us to a different level of intimacy because you know, when you're ha sort of having partnered sex with somebody, you're so connected, you're not really worried about how you look, you look at them. It's this was he was like off to the side. We weren't making eye contact. Yeah. It was just it was really hard. Uh, yeah. Did he like it? He did. Of course he wanted to jump on top afterwards. Yeah. And that was that was not the rule. And also you're right, it was hard to climax and I I didn't climax and I that wasn't the goal either. It really just had like I've had such a shift on masturbation and taking away the goal of orgasm for it so you can just have a pleasure session with yourself and it's not about the the orgasm you know yeah what are your thoughts on masturbation oh my god i think it's amazing i think everybody should be doing it every day and um but i think we probably all need a rewiring of it because most of us masturbate now how we did when we first started masturbating mm -hmm. because what happens is that you find what feels good and your brain makes a connection. You do it three or four, five, 10 times. Got it. That's the quickest way for me to feel, get what I need. You find ways of self, self soothing. I can't sleep. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, or, or destructive ways. You know, I'm just like, I'm bored. I'm just going to bang one out. Um, and actually it's almost what I've seen and what I, I believe is that we've actually neglected the rest of the body in masturbation it's pretty genital focused and so we miss out on full body orgasms if, if that's if we're lucky enough to be orgasming when we masturbate um, and it becomes this like build up build up build up in the genitals and then pew, jump off the cliff and then it's like oh so intense and then it's over yeah. Instead of um, what I've seen and, and, and learnt that we can do is actually like cultivate that sexual energy and through breath work and integrating the whole body, yeah, you can have the buzzing everywhere and it's more expansive, the orgasms, it's more rolling. It's, um, well, God damn, I love it a lot more. Let me just tell you, it's changed my life, you mm -hmm. know? Well, you're right. Like, I, well, if, well, I guess most people start masturbating at a young age. You know, when you're like teenagers and you go through puberty and you're like, oh God, this feels amazing. And then you take it into your adulthood and because it's what you know, it's what you like. And a human's like a quick fix. You know, we're lazy. We don't want to explore. We, whatever feels good, feels good. And I've found that personally, I took that into um, my relationships. Like I was like, oh, this is what I like. You know, can we do this? But in doing so, I was restricting my pleasures. Like, you just have to be able, you know, and they'll be like, oh, what if I do this? I'm like, no, 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 I, lo I know what I like. But really, in doing so, you're forgetting about everything else. It's a very common thing. I mean, the thing is, okay, so I've actually got my little clitoris here. I don't know if you can actually see this, but you can only see the oh. little gland. And then it's got the hood that goes over top of this shaft. 
wow. and then we've got this little button. And so when people talk about, you know, I can only come through clitoral uh, stimulation, it's like, of course, we have been given an organ that is purely for pleasure. There is no other job for the clitoris, right? Mm -hmm. And we've almost been shamed as women if we can't orgasm through internal vaginal penetration, mm -hmm. which in my, my thoughts is just a crock of shit because... If, if you give time for this clitoris to become engorged, like I was showing you with the vulva, if, like it takes a woman, sorry, a vulva owner, it takes her about 45 minutes on average to fully engorge and become fully aroused in this area. And when that happens... That's quite a long yeah, time. It is. I mean, I mean, nobody's really got time for a 45-minute session every time you're going to have sex. <laughs> but it's an interesting way to to explore and do things differently and see what feels differently in there. But once these are fully aroused and engorged, these, they all puff up. So any kind of stimulation you're having internally, it is still touching and affecting the clitoris. Like this mm. is a, an amazing pleasure tool. Like we should be incorporating it the whole time. That's what feels good. But there is actually some amazing little erogenous zones inside the vagina and I used to be like this mm -hmm, I know what I like I'm a click girl yeah. mm. and um, it wasn't until I started uh, yeah using dildos that I realized that wow it's actually a wonderland in there and so much like so much sensitivity and it's just I've woken up that area now and and, and now penetrative sex with a man is a million times better than it ever has yeah. And I, right. women, I'm not saying this for every single man in the world, but women, it's, I've talked about this before on the podcast, um, you know, like women, women's sex is a whole lot different because I feel like the goal is to make the other person orgasm, not just yourself. Right. Have you experienced that yet? No. I, I, do you mean with a, with a woman? Yeah. Have you? <laughs> no. But I've always been open to it because I am open to anything that's going to bring me more pleasure. And I think this is our bodies to learn about and to figure out what we like. It's, it's kind of like to me, like, yeah, okay, I like chocolate ice cream, but of course I'm going to try boysenberry because I want to taste the full range, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, you know? If you won't like it until you try it. Exactly right. I mean, but the, the, but yeah, the opportunity has never really arisen and I am very much like a connection with a person. So I think it would be more that than sex, I suppose. I mean, I like a, a hard dick just like turns me on so much, and, but I love being munched out, you know, so I feel like I'd be a great lesbian, you know, yeah. but I don't know if I could return the munching favour. I don't know, but I'm into it. I think why? Not? Yeah, I don't know. Do you know what no. a penis is? Yeah, yeah. I would. Pro I guess yeah. If I was gonna put uh, no, because I guess I haven't really dabbled in that realm. I've only really done men. Mm. But no, I don't really like labels. To be honest, I yeah. just yeah. So I'm not, a, I'm not a label person, but I feel like there's a lot of people that come to me and they feel just a whole lot. I guess. Um, more comfortable in their skin if they can say that's what I am like I understand now you know what I mean and and the pansexual is the most common one that when I tell people they're like fuck that's uh, that's exactly me I've been so confused my whole life I couldn't understand what I was or who I was and that right there that pansexual word um, is the most common one where people feel like they fit under the category that makes them feel you know safe and um, wanted and needed in the world so. Yeah, and such a beautiful thing if you have felt lost or confused, it, it gives you a place to yeah identify, and I, I think I think it's great. Oh, I wanted to talk about the sex toy thing as well because I, a, a couple of questions came in kind of around the same same um, wording, but someone said overuse of a satisfier pro. I'm worried the standard oral won't work anymore. Is this a thing? Because we were talking about that. Hey. Yeah, we were talking about that, and, and it is a thing, um, and it also goes back to what we are just talking about with the quick fix, and I'm, I'm so torn because, yes, I think any way that uh, people, women can find pleasure 
should be celebrated and should be done. Um, but there is there is this risk of numbing out the genitals and and like we we're saying about the early ways of masturbating, you're training your brain that that's the best, easiest, quickest way to feel the pleasure. And really, it's it's it is dangerous for us coming back to connecting in a partnered way, and um, we almost then need to do a whole retrain of that area. It's called um, can be motor amnesia down there. It becomes numb, sensory motor amnesia. So how we fix, well not fix, but how we support that is through sensate focus, where you would literally lay off it for a week. And then you would slowly start bringing in your own touch again to to get rid of the numbness. And um, yeah, I just think all these buzzing toys, some of them are so magic and that they're doing great things. But um, yeah, they can really uh, do some damage in terms of becoming too reliant on a, on a little tool that's a quick fix and, and the numbing out of that area. So would you say, what would you say for advice? Would you be like, look, cool, use the sex toys, but just maybe not 10 times a day. Don't just rely on it all the time. Would you say that? Absolutely. Yeah. I just wouldn't be reaching for it every time you're going to self-pleasure. Um, and also with sex toys, it's great to incorporate it with partnered sex as well, if you are with somebody. Um, because I think especially for men that are or dating women, um, I'm starting to see some insecurities show up ever since the old satisfier pros on the on the street um because it's almost like yeah they feel redundant in a way they so say out of 10 times of masturbating i would say three times use use a vibrator if that's you know kind of that kind of rationale that's what i would work to okay cool yeah. new um oh, while we're on the sex toy chat i want to talk to you about dildos um yes because you mentioned about the glass i've seen them the glass dildos. But for me, when I hear glass dildos, I think hard, ow, and what the heck happens if that breaks inside me? Yes. Well, um, I might I might just get my crystal one. Oh yep. Is it clean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it has to be clean. Clean is the most important. So this is actually my little one. This is my um rose quartz crystal dildo. Oh, wow, it's really a rose quartz. Yeah, so it's beautiful, and it's, like, weighty, and it's it's nice and smooth. Whoever came up with that was smart. That does not look like a dildo. You could have them around your house, and the people would be like, oh, I love you, Crystal. Little face massager, you know? Multi-purpose. <laughs> but it's like this. It's so smooth. This is so nice and cool, which is a beautiful sensation if it's going in, inside the vagina. Mm. Um, and do you know what? Like inside the vagina, it's so durable. It really is. Think about it. Babies can come out of there, you know? And so it's not going to do any damage. And it just molds into all the nooks and crannies. And cool. yeah, it's just, it's just, re it's a really different sensation from having like rubber in there. And it feels a lot more natural. And, um, I, and it's very rare. I've never heard of any cases of these like glass or crystal breaking. I'm sure it's possible. But so the thing about that, but what you had, it's actually not that big. No. So for me, this is I do have a bigger one. It's a big obsidian. Is that black. Black. Mm. Yeah. Um, but what I like because I do because I am quite spiritual as well, I, and I believe that uh, crystals hold an energetic frequency is that I am able to, I put it on my heart space first and I set an intention for myself and for my body before I even go near my genitals. Mm -hmm. And then I'm kind of carrying that in my, in, in my yoni and having, having that time. And it's, it's small enough that I can really reach my G spot when I first enter, I can kind of go in that sort of a upwards motion, hitting my urethral uh, sponge, which is the G spot. While we're on that, do all women have a G spot in the same kind of position? Yes, queen. We do. It's, it's, um, there's sort of three broken into thirds. As soon as you enter the vagina on the top wall, it's either at the front, right at the front there, or it's in the middle or at the back. So like three inside. There's, there's three, there's three places it can be. Oh, wow. So everyone's different. 
it, yeah. And, okay. and everybody has got one, but it's numb. For a lot of women, it's numb. Mm. So it is about um, finding it. And a lot, but there's also so much unknown about it. And that's why there's myths about, oh, no, people don't have a G-spot. Or, um, and some people say that the G-spot, you know, it actually is directly hitting up under some bits of the clitoris. So that's what is making it feel good as well. Um, yeah, it's still a mystery in there, which is kind of beautiful, which also gives us permission to, to find the bits that feel good for us. But yeah, after years and years, like probably it was only two years ago, I found my G-spot, you know, and that's a, what I do when I do yoni mapping. I find and help women find their G-spot. Do you, wait, okay, while we're on that, do, do any of your friends come to you and ask you yes. advice? I have seen and been inside with my fingers, um, probably 10 of my girlfriends Wow! now throughout my training. Yeah, they've, they've been so incredible um, to let me in there. And I had never seen a vulva up close before I'd done this training, you know. And I, what I couldn't believe was, you know, from looking at a vulva, you can't see in there. You can't see inside the vagina. And this amazing blind faith of just slipping fingers in was the most beautiful, heavenly feeling ever and not knowing what was going to be in there. And Why do you think I like women, girl? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, I've lost my train of thought. I really wanted to ask you something important. Oh, um, it'll come back. What other things can you do to spice things up instead of the normal go-to toys? It depends what you're doing, but you have to do something different. And so... Maybe you're not communicating properly about what you really like, or you're not communicating about what you'd like to try differently. Um, I think we can be really scared of offending the other person or implying that things aren't actually good enough. Um, so it really is, it's just a conversation starter. And, and usually slowing down is one of the first steps, I would say, and then taking away um, the agenda of, of an orgasm. It's, it, it's about bringing curiosity back and almost like, you know, what somebody liked one day, they might not necessarily like the other day, but we assume they do. And we assume that about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's about coming in with curiosity and exploring, like pretend you've never seen this body before. Yeah. Explore all the nooks and crannies in a different way. Like lick those ears, you know, tug on them. Yeah, it's, I don't know, just you mix to, it up. Like, it might sound dumb in the beginning, but you just never know. Like the most stupidest thing might turn the other person on. But it's all about like communication. Like, oh my God, here I am talking like I'm a sexologist. Um, you know, <laughs> but yes. communication, right? And I think it's so important because what happens if you're unhappy in the bedroom, but you're too afraid to tell your partner? Like it's such a big, important thing, sex life. Oh, and it, ju and it just builds then. It's, mm. it's harder and harder to talk about the longer you leave it. And then resentment builds, you know? Mm -hmm. And all it could take is like doing it in a different part of the house one day. Or, you know, it's just a little shift can really have an overflow of a lot more uh, exp exploration. Um, I want to also ask, what are your views on porn? Just because I feel a lot of people get miseducated from porn. And, you know, it's, uh, I know a lot of people watch it to get turned on and to get in the mood and uh, a lot of couples explore by watching that. But for me personally, I just can't, I can't get down with it. It's just, it feels like so fake to me. Like if I'm going to go and watch it, I'm going to pick like an amateur, an amateur video, you know, like it's more realistic. And also what pisses me off is that people's education on lesbian sex is through porn. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's definitely a place for porn, but however, how we consume it is very unhealthy. And yes, what you're talking about with education unfortunately it has become a place where a lot of our youth go and get mm. education on sex and it's a real shame because well for one most of it is if it's a uh, hetero sex that they're watching it is all about the men being pleasured by the woman mm. um, there are a lot of uh, body image issues that arise as well like labia um, that most of them have had labiaplasty, which is meant that they're in a labia, these bits in here. That's what I was going to talk about. It came back to me. Ah, perfect. Um, have been cut off, you know, because it's been deemed by society that to have uh, bigger inner labia than outer labia is, is not, it's not sexy. 
it's not the way, which is just not true because actually that is what most women have. Mm. I mean, there's just no right or wrong of what a labia should look like, you know? They're mismatched in size. Some are really big, some are small. It's just, it's the beauty of what we're packing down there. Yeah. And unfortunately, all the, a lot of these porn stars have had them cut off to be little and petite and all nicely tucked in. Um, and also, I guess what raises alarm bells for me is the um, violence in porn as well towards women. Mm-hmm. I think they did a study and there was about 80% of the videos actually made uh, of hetero porn was there was um, anger and malice and, and abuse mm-hmm. used in that porn. So I don't know what that does to our young men growing up, how they think they should be treating women. But there are people out there making ethical porn, which is like really beautiful and a lot more real. And the thing is, like, as humans, we are really curious. This is why we like reality TV so much. We kind of like to be able to spy on other people's lives. And so, of course, we're curious. We, we want to see other people have sex. Yeah. So it should be portrayed real. We should be able to see the real stuff. So this ethical porn that's being made is beautiful. And, um, and, and so there is a real place for it, I think. But, yeah, a lot of the, the porn that's just coming out is just brutal and not a true depiction of how sex between two people should be. That is a big thing. A lot of people watch porn and they've got their, what do they call it? Uh, I can't think of the other word except for a designer vagina. Yes, no. the, the labiaplasty. The labiaplasty, that's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. Um, were you finding it quite interesting how when you were, you know, exploring more vaginas in your business, you were like, wow, there's just so many. Like, they're all so different. And it's bloody okay for them to be different too. Absolutely. And they're just beautiful. They're like flowers and roses. And I, I just, I fell in love with them, you know? And I, and I was, every time I was like, this is, this is completely different from mine. This is completely yeah. different from the last vulva I was entering. Yeah. And I just, I just wish that there was a place or, or an, part of our education that we got to see this body diversity and vulva diversity. So that we just, I mean, nobody's nose is exactly the same. Why the hell should we expect our flaps to be exactly the same? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, penises just, are different as well. Penises are different, giants are different. Every, every single person is different. And that's exactly. the point. Why would you want to see and be with something that's exactly the same all the time? It's true, but labiaplasty is like the fastest growing cosmetic um, operation that's happening at the moment in the Western world. It's shocking. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a hard one for me because I wouldn't. I, I want everyone to feel like comfortable in their skin, and you know, I won't be against it because you know that's that's your own opinion, that's your own body, do what you want with it. But it's just you know, it's sad that the the fact that the need that they feel like to be normal, their vaginas have to look like whatever they see elsewhere. You know. Absolutely. And I mean, it's dangerous, those, I mean, it's not dangerous, but like it it takes a long time to heal. It can really desensitize that area Um, because it's actually like labia can feel so beautiful and can be so sensitive. It's just that soft little bit of skin, you know, you can make it come alive with lots of touching. And, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know. It makes me sad. I've got a real personal opinion about it, which I just, I, I'm the same as you. I think people should feel comfortable in their own skin, but I'm just, don't fucking do it, you know? This, yeah. If you're listening and you think that your vagina is so much different than everyone else, it's probably not. Um, okay, well, um, quickly before you go, I just want to know, have you had your first client yet since becoming qualified? Yes, I've had a few, actually. woo exciting. You're loving it? I love it. I mean, it's just not work for me. Yeah. Do you feel fulfilled? Yes, I do. I do. I love it. And it's, and I know it's not an ego thing when people are like, oh my God, you've changed my life. But it's like, wow, this person needed this, you know? So yeah, it, it, it's great. And I can see it's tangible in my eyes. I can see the difference I'm making. Whereas like with radio, I didn't know what the hell happened after I created my proposal or a campaign <laughs> went to air, you know? Yeah. You're seeing the changes. That's so cool, Morg. So proud of you. Oh, thank you, darling. What kind of people can come and see you? Well, I mean, that's a really interesting thing. And I suppose I haven't got my elevator pitch down Mm. yet. Why you'd come and see me. like, But I liken it to, you know, if your car is not running as smoothly as possible, you take it to the mechanics, right? There's no shame. It's like, it's just part of what you do. 
And I think with sexuality, we haven't prioritized that. We haven't made that something that we look to improve. Um, so I'm an educator first and foremost. So, so many people do not know much about sex or they haven't had the right education. So anybody, I mean, anybody can come and see me and it will be of value to them because they will get what they're looking for, even if it's just about becoming more embodied mm. in, in themselves mm. so they're less numb. Um, yeah, about finding new, new pleasure pathways, um, learning uh, healthy porn watching. That is something interesting that we touched on, but there is a way to cultivate that. Um, a, a mismatch in libido with partners. That's a big one. Um, and yeah, trying new things. I don't know. There's just lots. I mean, I've been working with lots of um, hapu women with their, their bodies, mm -hmm. you know, learning that they can actually, whilst they're creating a baby, it's still their body and they still have a right to pleasure. It's not all just about growing this baby. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so big. It's such a big spectrum thing. Yeah, well, that's the point because it's so big. I feel like a lot of people will be like, oh, when, when is the right time to go and see a sex sexologist? Why would I even see a sexologist? And especially after, you know, I'm posting that yesterday on Instagram, a lot of people were like, oh, I didn't even know there was such thing as a uh, sexologist. So it's so important to kind of talk about how, you know, the importance of having you and that people can actually come to you for absolutely anything. It doesn't even have to be to do with sex. Totally. Yeah, yes. so do you want to say where people can reach out to you? Yeah, well, uh, my website is currently in the making. So the easiest way would just be on Instagram, which you can find me at Morgan Penn on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. I'll put the tag. I'll um, tag Morgs in at the end of this video as well. Oh, beautiful. Well, next time you're in Auckland as well, we'll have to catch up. And... Yes, share vagina info. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for being on here, Hannah. Really appreciate it. And congratulations on the qualification and finally feeling fulfilled. That's, that's awesome. Thank you, darling. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. See you soon, eh? Bye, darling. Bye. Love and light. <laughs>